Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new unto us every morning. And though we have not deserved your goodness, you abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness toward us, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so we are in chapter 54 of Isaiah, and that means we're getting closer and closer to the end. That's kind of the exciting part of all of this. Uh, but today, we're actually going to be kind of focusing on the concept of children. Okay? Now, in Scripture, children can have, a, uh, has been used as a way of describing God's blessings uh, to families. And so when children don't come uh, and a couple is dealing with infertility, uh, sometimes people have considered it to be a curse from God. So we're going to keep this in mind uh, as this next section will deal a little bit with that barrenness. And it says, barren Israel bears children. Okay, And that is part of a, a, a scriptural theme. Uh, we, if, you don't have to go too far in scripture where you will find that God has purposely used what I would consider infertility as a, a way of saying, don't worry, promises will come and they will be fulfilled and you will be really, really blessed. So it, it, you could say it's almost like a, a great deal of de uh, delayed gratification. God says, it's not going to happen in your time, but when it happens, you will be truly blessed. So keep that in mind as we sort of dive into uh, 54. Uh, let's start with verse 1. Uh, Sing, O barren one, who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Now, I just want to just stop with, and just, with this and just look at the logic behind that. Does God not know how to count? Okay, Because he's basically saying, the children of the desolate one, well, if you're barren and you don't have any children, that's a zero, okay, is more than the children of her who is married, which then assumes that she had many children. And so you're like, how can zero be greater than Let's just say 5, 10, 15, okay? Remember, they had a little bit larger families back then. And the answer to that, uh, God does know how to count, okay? Is that God also understands the amount of his blessings. So when God blesses, he truly blesses. And so scripture brings up this theme here. Uh, even in the midst of what would be considered sadness and pain, uh, now God is going to say, rejoice. So how does this first apply to Isaiah and the time, people during this time? Well, you could say as they were going into exile, okay, the, that it was a time of sadness. Uh, they were not very, very fruitful, not necessarily as far as children are concerned, but let's just talk about it as spiritual fruitfulness. But then in their repentance and the return out of exile, they will truly be blessed. This actually gets picked up in the New Testament scriptures uh, from Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. St. Paul writes, But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear, for, bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. So St. Paul picks up on this passage, and he's going to bring a, a spiritual nuance into this and talk about as Christians being the spiritual children of Israel. Okay, and if you think about this numerically now with spiritual children, okay, the people of Israel had rejected God, okay, they said no to their Savior. God then takes his promises to the Gentiles, 
and the promises of God grow and expand. So what was once a zero, so to speak, from God's point of view of those that were like believing and trusting or is a very low number, now all of a sudden is becoming fruitful and expanding. So God uses this idea of trying to teach the people that while you may be looking at physical numbers, God is looking at the heart. And so God wants the people to believe and trust in him and God does indeed bless, even when things seem to be at its bleakest or at the most disadvantaged. And so I want to toss in one other uh, promise here, coming from the Old Testament, from Genesis chapter 17, beginning with verse 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Okay, so Abraham is basically saying, you know, we're old. My wife and I are old. Uh, I do have a child through Ishmael, through Hagar. But notice God's reaction. Verse 19, God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Okay, so again, let's just count the numbers here. Abraham is saying, I have one, and it's through Hagar, Ishmael. And God says, no, I'm going to bless you through Sarah. But Abraham's like, I've got zero through Sarah, and it doesn't look like there's any possibilities. So, yes, there's a, you have God's almighty uh, action coming, and God can do anything he wants to do, and yes, Sarah is blessed. And if you consider the spiritual children that come from Abraham and Sarah with Isaac, that is all of Christianity, okay? So, yes, in the end, the numbers that are coming through uh, the, the children of the promise, so to speak, are much greater than what was realized right then and there to Abraham. So again, the idea here is that we trust in the promises of God, even when the events around us may seem like it doesn't seem to be going that way. We know that if God says you will be blessed, the answer is, you will be blessed and there will be rejoicing. John? God is telling me that it's my plan, not yours. You're right. God is telling us it's his plan. Okay. Uh, and it's not our plan and just to keep our faith and trust in his plan. Jolynn, did you have a question? I have often, I have heard it said, I don't say often, I've heard it said that Ishmael then was the, was the beginning of Yeah, Muslim, I think the right word. Uh, Muslim nation. Yes. Yes. So, God's kind of setting up a problem here. Is, is God setting up the problem? Or is um, humanity setting up the problem? Because when humanity trusts in the promises of God, there's no problem. And so even, let's just back up to Abraham for a moment. Was Abraham always trusting in the promises of God? No, otherwise uh, we wouldn't have had the issue with Hagar and uh, Ishmael, okay? But even, and, and so what, what's interesting about the Old Testament is the Old Testament will give us the great matriarchs and patriarchs of the Bible and will show us their sinfulness. And you're like, why? And the answer is because we're sinful. To remind us that God will still work through our sinfulness to accomplish his will. Yes. So even though 
uh, Sarah and, and, and Abraham sort of gave up on having children, henceforth Haggai, uh, Hagar entered the situation with Ishmael. Um, God's like, no, I will complete my promise. It will happen and it will be fruitful and abundant. And notice again, if you notice man's work and action that you could say was characterized with Abraham and uh, Hagar with Ishmael, and then you can move that into the, the, um, the founding religion then of uh, Islam, okay? versus God's promise through Abraham and Sarah with Isaac and God sending the Savior through that promise, Jesus, who atones for the sin of the whole world. Okay, in, in humans' worlds as we see it today, we may see the tension and the clash between these two families. But remember, from God's point of view, only one family truly believes and trusts in him. Okay. And God does want all people to be saved. I don't know, did I kind of address uh, what you were thinking of, Jolene? No, I, I okay. mean, I get it, but it just still, it's still my human thought wants to say, this just doesn't make sense. Well, God made, uh, God made Abraham the promise that he would have the sun and the numbers and the stars in the sky. But Abraham got tired of waiting. Right. So he took it upon himself to take his servants from Sarah's permission to have relations with the servant, and then we got Ishmael. Right. But that wasn't God's plan. That was man's plan. Right. He decided that he couldn't wait, and his wife was pressing for a child, and thought that our age, we've got to hurry up and get this done, and we'll never have time. And, uh, and that, so it was man's decision, humanity, who caused that. And if, you, and if you go back to that promise that God made to uh, Abraham that your descendants will be as numbered as the stars of the heaven or the sand on the seashore, did Abraham actually realize that before he died? The answer is no. He would see one biological offer, offspring, and that's Isaac. But God wasn't done yet. And so that's part of our take-home point is just because we don't quite realize it or see it in our lifetime, it doesn't necessarily mean that God did not fulfill his promise. It is fulfilled and still being fulfilled. His descendants are truly, if you want to say, especially spiritual descendants of that promise are still growing in number. Okay. Yes, Abraham would have died thinking I had one biological uh, child. Okay, but he died in an, in, in an anticipation that through this one child, yes, the world would be saved. Pure selfishness. That, welcome to the human race. Thank you, John. Pure selfishness. You're right. That is perfect. Yeah. John tells him, I'm going to make Ishmael a great nation. He's going to bless Ishmael. He's going to make him, yeah, he's going to just as much. I mean, it's kind of what he's saying. Don't worry, let me but God has God has a purpose for that, and I don't understand all the purpose for it. But I know that if God said, "I will do this," Ishmael will be blessed because that is what Abraham said in verse eighteen oh, uh, to God: "Oh, that Ishmael might live before you." And I love your question because it's just reaffirming something. You've helped me make a decision. So like when we restart up Sunday Bible study, I think we're going to start plowing through the book of Genesis. Okay. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to be uh, very much, very much like uh, God-like here and say, you're going to have to wait for it. <laughs> it's coming, but you got to wait for it. It's not today. It's a coming. Okay, uh, Hilda. Um, And when the prophets profess the word of the Lord, and it's truly from the Lord, there are some things that come to pass that are short term. You know, like it's, right. it's imminent. There are things that are midterm. And like the book of Revelation, that still, even though sometimes it looks like it's getting really close, that still has not been completely fulfilled. So sometimes, like Noah, he was building an ark. It was a 
There was no water. And he's building this ark, and it, over a hundred years it took him to build it. How many times did people make fun of him, you know, his family? But yet he kept on. It was a long-term, longer-term prophecy. But he believed it, and he stuck to it. So we may not see all the things that God promises in our own lifetime, but God's one year could be a thousand years in his time. Right, so when God makes a promise, it may be fulfilled immediately, as you were saying, or it might be filled a little bit later on, or it still might yet to finally be fulfilled, like the second coming of Christ. That has not happened yet. So, again, we just trust in the promises of God. Okay, how about if we move on, though? Uh, let's get into uh, verse 2. So, again, we're, we're setting up the scenario that God is going to be blessing and he's going to give you lots of children. And what happened when uh, the Bala family was blessed with uh, children? Uh, we kind of realized the townhome we were living in was not big enough. Okay. And so we get the same thing here uh, in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 2. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtain of your habitation be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cores and strengthen your stakes, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people, uh, and will people the desolate cities. Uh, so again, you have uh, God saying it's time for your building and expansion program because you're going to be blessed with more people. Okay, and so yes, God was doing that. And you got a picture if if you're coming out of exile, okay, and there's just a remnant coming out of exile, and God says, you know that land that you had before, you're going to need more room, and you're sitting there going, more room for what? Okay, and again, it's called trust in the promises of God. So I paired this with another Bible passage from Isaiah that we covered earlier. From Isaiah chapter 49, verse 20, the children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me, make room for me to dwell in. Okay, giving you that same picture. And what are we referring to? The children of the bereavement, kind of the children coming out of exile. Okay, uh, out of that time of desolation, of barrenness, now coming back into God's grace and guess what? Make room because God is going to be blessing them uh, and it will be uh, fantastic. Um, and how does God bless the people? How does God cause this expansion, especially in today's world? And the answer is trust in the promises of God. It is through the promises of God's word that God changes the heart. Remember, uh, God is counting hearts, so to speak. Uh, and so even though numbers might be uh, little that we can count, God truly does know the heart and through his word and his promises, God causes his children to grow and expand in number. And I'm impatient, I can't you're right, John. We are impatient. We can't wait. Uh, fortunately, we have a very patient God who is not only patient with us in our own rebellion, he can wait and in his time. He's got it all figured out. We just have to trust in him. But you're right. Uh, we do get impatient. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether I'm a little one getting impatient or whether I'm an older one getting impatient. Okay? <laughs> Because as we were kind of mentioning before with uh, Sarah and Abraham getting impatient and henceforth uh, Hagar entered the situation when she probably shouldn't have. Uh, but that's, uh, we'll save that for our Genesis Bible study when we get to that on Sundays. Okay, let's continue on with verse 4. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your maker is your husband, 
The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. Okay, now we got a couple of themes being presented here and a little bit of a shift here. So we're going moving from children to a spousal theme, okay? Uh, and again, with that same promise, don't be afraid. Uh, you were once disgraced because you were in exile, but things are going to change. And to pick up on that spousal theme and that disgrace in exile, uh, in verse 4, you have the concept of widowhood, okay, where your husband dies, so to speak. And, and that's a very interesting picture here. So if I, if I put this picture together with Israel being the bride, the groom being God, okay, and that's a very scriptural picture as we will get into the next slide. Uh, St. Paul picks up on that concept. Did God die? No. Well, it's talking about a widowhood. And in, in reality, okay, you're right, God did not die, but did God abandon yes. Israel? Yes. Okay. And, and so you get that little bit of that picture here of that abandonment thing. Okay. Uh, and, but you get a glimmer of hope coming through. Verse, four, verse 5, for your maker, referring to your creator, is your husband, okay? And you got to remember the people of Israel came out of exile. Um, verse 6, for the Lord has called you like a wife. So that's beginning to set the scene. Who's doing the action? Who's going to be doing the reclaiming? Even though she was desolate in, in exile, so to speak. Even though she was barren in exile, God is going to remember his promises and he's going to call her out. Uh, uh, even though she was cast off. Now, I got a little bit of an interlude here, okay? So just bear with me in my interlude. So just hang on to this thought because I want to bring in a couple other passages from the New Testament. Picture uh, bringing in or re re reaffirming this picture theme of Christ as the groom and the bride as the church. So from um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28, in the same way husbands should love their wives as his own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This, is a, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So, St. Paul is building on this illustration that Christ is the groom, his bride is the church. This illustration would also be picked up uh, in the book of Revelation chapter 19. Verse 7, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these words are the true words of God. And these are the true words of God. Okay, so again, uh, scripture uses that theme that Christ claims us as uh, the groom claims uh, the bride. And that same theme was even then presented to the people of Israel, uh, Israel during the time of Isaiah. So let's go back to Isaiah. Remember I said hang on to that illustration to verse 7. For a brief moment I deserted you, God is kind of saying, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you. 
remember I asked, did God die? And we kind of said, no, he really didn't die, at least in this uh, like illustration here. But you had that abandonment or that hiding of the face, okay? But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. So God allowed the exile to occur in anticipation of gathering the, the remnant to reaffirm his love and his commitment upon the people of Israel. So let me, uh, I also had another uh, passage I wanted to bring into this from Exodus chapter 34. The Lord, uh, verse 6, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions of, and sin, but by whom will, I'm sorry, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now here, um, God is describing the difference between his anger and his love. His anger lasts just a few generations, but his love lasts for thousands of generations. The people of Israel, as they were coming out of exile, just got through at the tail end of his wrath, so to speak. Okay, which did last for uh, a generation. And a couple of generations had to experience that. Uh, but now here comes the love. And so if you take a look at that illustration of a couple generations of anger versus thousands of generations of love, you see that we have a God who is rich in mercy and grace and wants to be known as a God of love and forgiveness and that his wrath is not part of his base nature but is an exception that will come out when humanity gets fixated on its sin and refuses to repent. God will allow his wrath to appear as the people of Israel also experienced. Okay, John, question, comment? That's part of the sentence. It's a, it's a, by no means clear the guilty. Is he talking about the end times here? Um, could be, could be. Um, what I'm going to say is it doesn't necessarily mean the end times. It can also be referring to the end times that, yes, there's a place called hell. But we're also reminded that it's more of an accountability. Okay, and that accountability is even today. Okay, God does not delight in our sin. Okay, now thanks be to God, we have a Savior, Jesus. Okay, so we should always be going running to that Savior. But when we, we hear, when we see the words, you know, that God will not clear the guilty, you're right, that should spark up a little voice in the back of our mind going, Whoops, I've just got reminded of my sin, which is a good voice. Because then for the Christian, what do we do when we hear that voice? We return to our Savior and say, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. And we are reaffirming that love. So uh, nothing wrong with a little bit of that law speaking to us here and now. But ultimately, you're right, John, it will be fulfilled on the last day. Yeah, Hilda? I have a question on the text where it says, um, number 7, verse 7, keeping steadfast love. Now, at that point, it doesn't specify that it's thousands of generations. It just says thousands. So, are you assuming that it's generations? Yes, I'm assuming that it's generations because keep reading in the comparison within that verse. Right. So, you have keeping love, okay, uh, and forgiving for those uh, who are in relationship, okay? But for those who are guilty, you have uh, the basic anger and wrath. And so now you have the comparison of the thousand versus the comparison of the third and fourth. And the answer is generation. And so that's why I will unpack it this way. And if, I'm trying to do this from memory here, but I think the other parallel passage to this in, I think it's in Deuteronomy, 
I think spells it out a little bit clearer. I didn't pick that passage, but maybe I should have instead. But yes, uh, just in within that context, you see that relationship of the number comparison. We are talking about generations there, even though it wasn't specifically spelled out. The study Bible says generations. Huh? The study notes say generations. The study notes say generations, yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions about that? Okay. Then uh, let's go on to 9 and 10. Now we're shifting gears a little bit more. Remember, we started with infertility, and then we started with a spousal theme, okay? And now we're moving to verse 9. This is like the days of Noah to me. And you're like, wow, God, you're jumping all over the place here. Well, he's God. He's allowed to do that, okay? As I swore that the waters of Noah should not go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So the, the, the thread between these illustrations is that constant steadfast love of the Lord. He wants to be known as a God of love and compassion. Just as uh, the first illustration of the barrenness with the children, the second illustration of the, the widowhood with the reclaiming of the spouse, and now uh, again, uh, just recalling the promises of God now through Noah, okay? And by the way, that's coming up in our readings in, I think it's in the month of July. It's either, yeah, I think it's in July. Uh, we're going to have that Noah account, so it's coming up this summer. Uh, but anyway, just as a reminder that God does indeed keep his promises and he is showing compassion. So just bringing in from Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, uh, I, where God says, I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now we've had floods, but those have been more local floods. But now God is saying his promise is he's not going to destroy the entire earth. And what was the sign of that promise? The rainbow. The rainbow. And so we should not be afraid of that sign of the rainbow as a promise of God. But as the church, we should be reaffirming the promises of God. And yes, you might be thinking, that sounds like a good sermon. It's coming. It's coming. Trust me. The title of that sermon is Reclaiming the Rainbow. Okay? But uh, so more about that when we get to that. But again, let's not give up on the promises of God, even though they might uh, uh, not yet been fulfilled. But some of them, most of them have already been fulfilled. Okay, let's go on to uh, verse 11. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in at, 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 sorry, I can't speak for it today. I will, set, I will set your stones in atomy and lay your foundations in sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of agate, your gates of uh, carbuncles, and your walls of precious stones. And all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Okay, so you get the beauty of the precious stones being brought up. Oh, and, and I could have tossed another passage in here, uh, especially from St. John's Revelation with the beauty of heaven and all those precious stones. But uh, for right now, I'm going to put, put that aside uh, because the, the key is not necessarily the beauty of the precious stones. The key is that the relationship peace will be established. And you see, your children shall be taught by the Lord. What was once separated is now reconnected. So that relationship between Christ and his bride, the church, 
uh, gets reestablished. And that's the key. So even though we may adorn churches with lots of decoration and we are blessed like with lots of artwork and stained glass even here at Peace, uh, the key is that relationship of the forgiveness of sins that is being proclaimed here. Uh, and if the artwork picks up on that uh, relationship, even better. Uh, let me just finish up with the Jeremiah passage, then I'll get to you, John, in a second. From Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And again, that just is bringing out that relationship piece that the Lord is going to be teaching us. Uh, because there's no longer this separation, sin is removed. Okay, John? Um, and going back to Isaiah 54, uh, reading the, the gates of, will be made of carbuncles, is that a negative? I did not perceive that as a negative. Help me <laughs> out. Carbuncle is described as, oh wait, that was the antinomy. Carbuncles of agate. Even tall buildings are bejeweled. Carbuncles, rubies, or crystal. So it was used in a positive way of like a precious uh, stone. And For those of us who are not mineralogists like me. I thought it was, because it was a gate, I thought it was a preventative. Oh, no. Well, even the, the gates will be decorative. Okay. Uh, that, that begs an interesting question, though, uh, which I, I'm sure you would love to debate, is why does heaven need gates? Okay. Uh, if only the chosen of God are going to be there and those in hell are going to be stuck there, the answer is sometimes gates are decorative. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, you're, you, you have the freedom to leave heaven, but I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Okay, the, yeah, the gates are just decorative. They're not designed to keep people uh, in or out, per se. Okay, let me uh, move on here. Uh, 14 and 15. In righteousness, you shall be established. You shall be far from uh, oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Okay, so a couple things are going on in, the, in these passages. First of all, you have the righteousness. In righteousness, you will be established. That comes from steadfast love of God, uh, not from our rebellion, plain and simple. Um, but then, I love what verse 15 says. If anyone stirs up strife, it's not from me. you got to remember, God did stir up strife. That's how they got into exile. God used uh, the enemies of Israel to, put, to punish Israel. Okay? And now God is basically saying, if, you're, if you have enemies, it's not from me here. Okay? But be assured, because of me, they will fall. They're not going to harm. Okay? They, they will fall. So... Previously, God raised up the uh, enemies of Israel to teach Israel a lesson, but now God says, not for me. So if strife comes, it's not my doing. Yeah, hold it. A little confusion, confusion for me as to what time of the season he's talking about. If he's talking about when um, righteous fellowship, you shall be established. So is that the new heavens and the new earth? Is that how that works? Correct. Uh, so verse 15, I'm going to probably say would be in the exiles point of view as they were coming out of exile, reestablishing Jerusalem. Yeah, while they're still living this side of eternity, um, so to speak, this side of heaven, uh, they're going to, there is always going to be strife. But you're right. On the other side in heaven, there will be no more strife and no more pain. So I think at the basis of your question, you were, you were looking at verse 14 and saying, in righteousness, 
Is that a reference to eternal life on the other side of heaven's gates, so to speak, or in our daily life? And I'm going to answer that by saying yes, but for us it's more of a, a reference that we are righteous now because of Christ. And so I'm going to focus mostly on our daily life here. And that's why I'm going to say uh, for verse 15, it's not uh, referring to the other side of heaven's gates, but to uh, this side with us here and now. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, let's go on to uh, verse 16. Behold, I have cre created the smith who blows the fires of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. I have also created a ravager to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Okay, now we might be confused uh, if we weren't more confused uh, uh, before. And we might be thinking, okay, is this going to be a time of peace, or is this going to be a time of war? And the answer to that is it is a time of peace, but at the same time, while we're still living in this world that is filled with sin, we understand that the people of God will also be under attack. Okay? And so what God is saying here is uh, even though weapons will be created, so to speak, uh, they're not going to destroy you. Okay? And uh, that no weapon will succeed really in destroying you. And I want you to think of this in the way of not necessarily of bodily life. I want you to be thinking of this in the way of spiritual life. Okay? Very much like faith cannot be taken away from you. You can give up that faith, but Satan cannot snatch that faith away from you. Satan can snatch away the opportunity to hear God's word from you. But Satan cannot snatch away God's gift to you, okay? And so I want you to be thinking of this along spiritual realms because when the people returned out of exile, did they have conflicts? Yes. Did sometimes people die? Yes, okay? They were always going to be having conflicts and there would always be people who died. But the, the spiritual aspect here that God would be their God and they would be their people, uh, that new covenant is what's being established and is the key is that they are in this faith relationship and nothing will take that away from them. And so the Lord is now reaffirming that they are his heritage. Okay. And that's why I bring up this Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 26 passage. And Moses prayed to the Lord, O Lord, do not destroy your people and your heritage, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Moses is here is praying to God for his intervention uh, and is reminding God that his people are his heritage. Okay, And so again, focusing on the relationship here. Uh, not the numerical count per se. Any questions about that as we finish up this section on the barrenness? Yes. Moses is reminding God. Yes. That's interesting. No, there's a reason for that. Such a deal. Be why does Moses need to remind God? Because God forgot? No. That Moses and the people need to be reminded and that so as Moses reminds the people, it's a reaffirmation of their faith and trust in God. It, it, it's almost like a, a child going up to mom and dad and saying, you promised it's Saturday and you promised to take me to the zoo. It's now Saturday. Let's go. Reclaiming the promises of God, so to speak. And so uh, sometimes when we start despairing, we might be thinking, is God going to fulfill this promise? 
Well, God is already promised. What do you mean? God won't fulfill his promise? No, God's going to fulfill his promise. Where's the doubt? The doubt is on our side. So yeah, Moses is going to say, okay, God, you promised this to us. Don't forget. Because it seems like from our point of view, we're, you're forgetting here. And uh, God, I would say, imagine just smiles and says, no, I have not forgotten, but I'm glad you remembered. Okay, Hilda. Um, where it says about a weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed, um, it, it reminds me a lot of the crucifixion of God where Satan thought he had him defeated. Ooh, I he, like that. He thought he had killed him on the cross. And kind of like t in today's world, if we keep our faith and trust in God, I mean, God died uh, in, in uh, human tense. People thought he died on the cross. But God showed us that death could not keep him down. That there was a heaven, he was resurrected to heaven, and then promising us that we kept our faith and trust in him. That even if our mortal bodies die, even if somebody came against us and killed us physically, Never fear, because we will be with him. We will live forever with him if we keep our faith and trust in him. Yep, I just want to just, you, you, you touched on something. First of all, I loved how you brought in Christ into this by saying that just as Satan thought that as Christ died on the cross, that Satan won, and uh, that Satan's... Uh, uh, you could say his weapons of crucifixion succeeded as Christ rose from the dead he proved to Satan no the weapons of crucifixion did not succeed so yes uh, Jesus Christ true man true God dies on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and on the third day God the Father raises him from the dead uh, and again that, that, that also fits in well with the overall theme that even though these bodies of ours will die, we know that we will also be raised from the dead on the last day and be given new spiritual glorified bodies. So again, the whole key is that relationship piece. Do you believe and trust in the promises of God? Do you see Christ as your Savior? And if you do, then great. Don't worry about what happens to this body per se. Continue to put your faith and trust in God. I'm just going to go um, into the outline for a moment uh, because I'm at a good stopping point, so we're not going to go forward, uh, but just to let you know what's coming up next. So in chapter 55, we're going to be talking about the Lord's invitation. And with an invitation, we're setting the scene that God is going to be doing the giving, and we're doing the receiving. And it's very important that we understand that because we get ourselves into problems when we start thinking, oh, I've accomplished this. No, I have not accomplished anything. It is God who has accomplished it through me. And so we're gonna be picking up on the Lord's invitation just as the Lord has uh, called Israel back into relationship with him. Now this invitation is going to be unpacked a little bit more, so that's going to be uh, next week. We'll pick up uh, chapter 55. But uh, let's close uh, with the Lord's Prayer. We pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.